And he said, well, it doesn't really matter. You know, you know, if you've got clean fingernails, regular features will take you. Anyway, they offered me this seat and uh, I, I won the seat and became a district councillor. I had four years uh, as a conservative and, um, and stood as a, a parliamentary, I got on the candidates list and stood as a parliamentary candidate in the 2001 keep the pound election. But, um, you know, really, I'm still a social democrat and uh, four years was enough. I made a lot of friends. Uh, I, I learned a lot about how the big parties work. Uh, and um, I mean, I could go on, but basically, unless you're one of the you know, top three or four people in the party at any particular time, uh, you don't have huge influence. And they're very, very broad churches, of course. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that approach, but it's, it's I think if, if you particularly, I mean, we'll probably go into it, but if you have a particular type of politics like ours, which is a, a mix of red and blue, really, mm. uh, neither, neither party will do. Mm. I think that the, the, the thing you've touched on there of the mix of red and blue is something that we are seeing more of a resurgence of in, part, in, in British politics at the moment. Um, mm. Paul Embury's book, Despised, says in the introduction that the vast majority of voters, or at least the vast majority of working class voters, consider themselves to be left-leaning economically but right-leaning um, socially. Is that broadly the demographic that the SDP is aiming at, or is that just a sort of happy coincidence? We don't really, we don't, we don't really aim in that sense. What we we have a, a type of politics, and and um, where that type of politics lands just happens to coincide with. It's true that a lot of the red wall, uh, you know, uh, people, you know, our thinking coincides with that. Uh, we're a very small party, and a lot of them don't know we're here. But if you did, I've said before, if you did a blind testing and t- tasting of our, our politics, we'd win quite a lot of elections pretty quickly. Um, Paul Embry's right about that. I mean, you know, he, he was kind enough to send me a copy of his book, and his, and I don't think there's very much different difference between his uh, type of type of outlook and ours. I would take I would take um, I, I, I'd question. Are we, we even we 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 summarize our politics, you know, in lots of ways. You know, patriotic centre left or or culturally traditional and, and, and so on, or left leaning on economics, whatever. Lots of ways of describing it, but to say that the that to have a sort of culturally traditional approach to social issues is right wing. Actually, that I mean, I, I'd contest that it, it never was. Um, there's no particular reason why you would regard it as right wing. Um, the views of Clement Attlee and Hugh Gateskill uh, and Peter Shaw, uh, all of whom were pretty, you know, pretty sort of centre of the Labour Party. Certainly not not even uh, centre left. I'd say in Shaw's case. Um, but they have very culturally traditional views, and certainly, you know, the old, the old way of thinking in the Labour Party. We are an, a, an offshoot of the Labour Party, and I think, you know, in some ways, we're very proud of parts of Labour's history in that. So, I, yeah, you could summarise it as, as culturally um, centre right or whatever, but 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 not really historically, not really. I mean, you, as I say, you're you're just as likely to get a, a culturally traditional view of, uh, you know, of traditional um, Labour voters, particularly in places like the North East where I'm from. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think perhaps that's indicative of our economic or overly ec- economised way of thinking about politics because, broadly speaking, right wing is considered to be uh, economically liberal, um, which traditionally is defined by the Conservative Party, and of course, therefore, you have a sort of linguistic connection between conservative and right wing. Um, mm. But I think you're absolutely right in saying that, that r- social conservatism is neither a left or right issue, it's more of a, um, what, what if, if it's, actually that's more of a question I suppose, in, in, in the sense that if you don't think it's a right or left issue, what is it an issue of for yourself? It's, it's, it's a question of, of being able to, to hold on what, to what you love basically, um, it's a question of, of change and dealing with change uh, and, and that's why as I say I don't think it's, I don't think it's particularly left or right, um, I think you're just as likely to value uh, traditional, the, th- the sort of foundations of your society and your community, if you have a left-wing outlook on economics, as if you have a liberal one. I don't, I don't, I don't really see it coincides. The interesting thing is that, um, I, I, I mean, in, during this conversation, I don't want to be too cruel on conservatives, but the thing is that certainly in the way it manifests itself in party politics with the Conservative Party, the Conservative in inverted commas, because they haven't really conserved very much, but um, a lot of a lot of liberal econ just doesn't go with social conservatism at all. I mean, liberal econ is very very harsh 
on on the traditional family. It's very indifferent to some things that social conservatives might value. And um, so it doesn't really, you know, as a, as a political program, mm. the the two don't really fit. And it's, it's interesting, you know, uh, the Conservative Party will give a little bit of lip service to things like fam the family. Mm. Uh, but actually, you know, during, during election time usually, but uh, actually, if you look at their record in terms of policy and what they, what they advocate, uh, they are pretty stridently anti-family. I mean, you know, there's not, I mean, you know, taking, taking uh, social housing off the table pretty much uh, hmm. over a generation is, I'm afraid you can't describe that as, as pro-family. That's extraordinarily hostile. And, and, and I see on the screen, there's a lot of young people in front of me. Well, if, you, if you're anything south of the wash, you're going to struggle. To, to do what normal, uh, what a normal reasonable expectation uh, would be previously, which is to, to possibly, if you wish, um, pair up, uh, possibly get a place, possibly uh, find a house and raise a family. You're going to find that very difficult. And the, the, the people that are culpable for that are basically eco-liberals eco who've just washed their hands of, 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 of uh, the state taking any active role in that. And it's something, if you go back a couple of generations, Clement Attlee, and even Harold Macmillan would have got this. I mean, they, they, they would have understood this, the uh, conservatives of the previous um, era, would have understood that the state can and should um, take a role in this. If you, you, so as I say, I, 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 I don't be too hard, but I mean, it, a lot of the things, that, a lot of the political programs, that, a lot of the political combinations which were offered uh, simply don't go together there. <laughs> Actually, it's and, and actually, if, if you think about it, we'll go into more probably as the interview goes on. But uh, they end up with really quite incoherent programs, uh, and um, so that you know, I, 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 not only would I question the, the sort of left-right spectrum, I, I just think even if you didn't accept that, your you know, conservative party is putting forward a series of policies which are, are anti-conservative. Really, mm -hmm. I think. Um broadly speaking I'd, I'd agree and I think it's particularly perceptive to talk about the, the the underlying tensions between the the right economics and the uh, the, the right social or professed social values um, but on, on the back of that I don't know if you've seen in the last week I imagine you probably have the uh, the new social covenant unit headed up by Danny Kruger MP and Miriam Coates MP uh, sorry Miriam Coates um, what are your thoughts on this? Is this is this promising, or do you think this is again just the Conservative Party paying lip service? Uh, no, I don't think it's, it's very very encouraging. I like Danny, and I, I think he's he's one of us really, but he's in a different party. That's all right. Uh, but um, I, I think uh, no, I think he gets it. I think he, some of the things, uh, some of the way that uh, document expresses itself are quite s glaringly similar to our, our sort of things. I think perhaps one or two people have read it, but. Uh, I don't mind. I, I'm happy if we, we influence people. I, I, I think conservatives that have our type of thinking inside the, inside the conservative party. I mean, you know, Philip Blond's project is has has some similarities to ours, just as Blue Labour does. Blue Labour is probably a little bit closer. I would say probably a little bit closer, but neither neither are, are exactly uh, our, our way of thinking. But they they are similar. And uh, if people want, to, if people prefer to to build. A sort of red, red, blue type program inside another party. That's fine. But the, as I, I've said many times to BLP, you know, to, to the Blue Labour people, we've got a lot of Blue Labour people just joined us instead. And the, and I think the reason they joined us was because the metaphor is that uh, you know Morris. And I, I, I adore Morris's program. I think it's fantastic, and I think Paul Embry is fantastic as well. But um, you know, I, I say to them that they're 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 at the back of the bus shouting, and they're not driving the bus. They're not going to drive the bus. Mm. I mean. You know the PLP. It's not just the PLP, but the the the, the, the Labour Party, the constituent Labour Party, and the membership in general, is extraordinarily progressive. They're basically like a big version of the Liberal Democrats. <laughs> and so Blue Labour is a tiny little project, really uh, admirable. Very. I mean, you know, Adrian Pabs and all the, in the Blue Labour book, uh, you know, that was published ten years ago. I, I've described as sort of bible for us. A brilliant book, mm. uh, intellectually. They won all the arguments, but the but they won't. They'll never drive the bus. And I, I've said to, 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 to Morris, you know, basically, you know, uh, our, our car is smaller, but at least we're driving it. <laughs> I, I, I see. So given, given that influence never goes one way, as a caveat, um, would you consider yourself 
to be more successful if you were to win seats in Parliament or if you were to convert more sitting MPs to your way of thinking? Like, which would you, would you prefer as a method to influencing British politics? Um, I, the, I met Nick Timothy uh, a little, you know, a couple of years ago, and had a chat to him, and he said, "Well, what do you want to do with it?" You know, because he because he, he, he liked he liked the new declaration, and, and said, "Well, what do you want to do with it?" He said, and I said, "No," he said, "Is it a think tank?" I said, "No, it's not a think tank. There are enough think tanks. Yes, <laughs> only one is full of think tanks, and there are enough intellectuals as well putting things out." So, and actually, Nick, he, he was quite surprised mm. that we were what we were doing. Was was the hard yards of actually contesting elections, and you know, probably, <laughs> probability of losing deposits over a few years, and, and 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 building regional parties, and actually building a proper serious uh, political party. And I, I, you know, I mean, uh, we're not crazy. I mean, it's going to take a long time. This it really is. It's you know, certainly a almost a generational exercise. And I think the um, the model in a party political sense, not a political sense, but a party political sense, is the Green Party. Uh, you know, which started as the Ecology Party in the 70s, and it's, it's, it takes a long time. But they're a national political party, and everyone knows, everyone's heard of them, and, and they get cut through, and they've got regional, they've got capacity to fight every seat in the country. And basically, that's where we want to go. And it's it's a harder project than than winning a, an intellectual argument. But um, you know, I, I think I don't regret. I, I I think it was very important to us to get the intellectual foundations right at the start to know who we were. I mean, when it, when the national committee initially as an interim basis appointed me as leader, I, I said, well, you know, apart from the fact that the party's got very small and has been knocked, kicked back to the hinterlands, I don't think we're clear about at that stage what we were, you know, I mean, there was honestly slogans from the 80s and some social market thinking, which is very good, but we weren't really clear and we, 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 you know, we, we published the new declaration to be clear. And, and I, I, I published it partly to, to dissuade people who weren't on the page. Mm. Not to join. I mean, I don't. I, I don't want to convene people that don't broadly. You'll never agree with everything. You know, you, there'd be ten percent, fifty percent you don't agree with. Um, but but you know, it was it was a very important document to 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 say this is what we're about. And you know, and if you if you if you if, if, if we share our type of politics, you know, with yours, then join us and let's see what we can build. Mm. And it seems to have been broadly going uh, going well. So obviously, it's uh, it's the right kind of thing. Um, on the back of that, one of the, I suppose, policy areas of the new declaration is the, the abolition of the existing House of Lords, um, at the very least its reformation into a more accountable institution. Um, given the recent moves, you know, it, it, the, the current climate um, towards the hereditary principle fundamentally, um, but but the recent Times article on the I think it's seventy roughly uh, lords that are that are hereditary still. Um, how likely do you think it is that we will see a, 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 an elected upper chamber in the next ten to twenty years? Uh, I mean, well, first on the thing itself, it, it's it's totally unjustifiable. I mean, I don't I, you know. Even even a party that's as sort of culturally traditional as us, uh, you know, and we're very in favour of the monarchy as a thing that Biden's adds to the gaiety of the nation and so on. But but no, I mean, an upper chamber that's that's a bunch of political appointee cronies and some hereditary peers and not the odd bishop or two. This is nonsense, actually. And uh, you know, if you read, you know, uh, early on in the 20th century, everyone knew it was a nonsense then. It was un unjustifiable, but it seems to have survived. I mean, you could argue that it survived because it sort of works and it doesn't. You know, it's a revising chain, but doesn't get itself into too much trouble, uh, and it has become a sort of repository of, 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 of as I say, grace and favour of people. I mean, some, a lot of people in there we like, but uh, in principle, it's wrong. I think we know it's wrong. Um, the our position constitutionally is a little, a little bit complicated, but I suppose it would take a little bit of time to explain it. But basically, it's it's, it's more a reaction. It's sort of bottom up reaction to what sort of structure of government you want. I mean, mm. you know. Uh, Greater autonomy for local government is very important. We like counties. We don't like regions. Uh, counties have a sort of historical meaning. You know, uh, you know, it's not just cricket. It's it's, it's who we are. And uh, so, if you have that as a basis, and you don't have regional government, you have to uh, address the English question. And there is an English question which is left dangling, and we're, we're sort of left hanging really uh, after you know the Celtic nations has got uh, devolution, mm -hmm. and um, you can't just leave it there. 
So if we, we propose an English Parliament, my, my preference would be to have an English Parliament with a, uh, a, 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 a chamber in, um, in York. Uh, I think that's the place for it. Uh, and I think that, that ought to happen. It is unfinished business. Um, it's not just technical things about English works for English laws and the West loathing question things. You know, there is an English question and uh, you can't... I think people that dislike Englishness uh, you know, and think it's a sort of forbidden thing, uh, are, are inclined to go for um, regional government. They want to shop England up into little bits. And the argument is run that you can't have an English parliament because it's so much bigger than Scotland and um, Wales. But there's a, a lethal error in that argument, a basic one, which is that if, if you think that uh, England's too big and English parliament's too big for the, for the union, then England is. I mean, if you think that way, if you think we can't have a union between those <laughs> very large... <laughs> then, then the union itself is at, is at risk. I don't believe that. So I think once you've cured that, uh, then you, then you, you know, if you have an English Parliament, you can't have two houses in. You can't have an upper house as well in, in Westminster. You have a UK uh, uh, unicameral situation. Um, can I have tea? For the help. Someone's going to have to mute. <laughs> sorry, a couple of people are on, have got yeah. there. Yeah. I'm very sorry about that. Don't worry, no, it's good fun. It's, it's, uh, it's the way it is. Yeah. So I hope, I mean, I hope I explained that. Um, you know, that it's, um, the trouble with the Constitution is that you can't, it's a bit like a sort of, you know, uh, as Rod Little would say, a sort of, um, you know, a, 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 a jumper knitted by a moron. If you pull one, one bit of thread, it'll all fall apart. And you, you can't actually do, you can't actually do one thing without it affecting the others. That's, that's the point we're making. And I think when you look at, sort of early 19th century through to essentially middle 20th century conservatives the argument was that but used as a as a positive that if you if you if you pull one thread the whole thing will fall apart or more accurately if you tip over one domino the whole thing will go um, but but obviously in the 21st century there's a certain argument to make in terms of efficiency um, and accountability especially with a with a mass suffrage uh, d democracy like we have um, mm. but in terms of um, you know we, one, one question that we, we were coming up with amongst the editors we thought would be quite fun which would be in a post-Covid world if the SDP took power tomorrow what would be the first thing that you would implement wow that's, that's, a, that's a phenomenal question um, I don't, we're not our approach to politics is not short term at all. We're, 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 I think we, one of the things that we get intellectually is that a lot of the things that, that, are, that are problems are problems because we've had sort of 20 or 30 or 40 years of them building up as problems and they haven't been dealt with. Mm. So we don't, to be honest, we don't really think like that. I mean, we're, so I'll give you an example. So we've got a, you know, chronic. A goods trade deficit with the EU, and we've got a, a national, you know, trade trade deficit. We do much better with the rest of the world, but um, now, you know, we've just been encouraged to think that doesn't matter by by sort of liberal econs. It doesn't matter very much, uh, but it does matter actually because you know you can only pay for a trade deficit in three ways: you pay it with goods you, you make now, uh, you can issue debt and pay for promises for tomorrow, or you can sell something you've already made. That, that's basically a mathematical identity and. Uh, and if you run persistent trade deficits, you will you will end up getting poorer. Basically, um, uh, it, the conservatives are very good at, at, at disguising selling things that we've already made as, as as FDI, foreign direct investment, every year. But really, it's just selling what you've already made. Uh, and no sensible country would run <coughs> de trade deficits for, for persistently of that size for, for a long time, uh, unless you really had drunk the sort of liberal uh, econ Kool Aid and you, you convinced it better. But the pandemic has actually uh, dealt with that. I mean, the pandemic has, has proved that the West's indifference to domestic industry has, has, has ended up being lethal, actually, and uh, we've got to address it. So just to give you that, that as an example, we, we, we want manufacturing to go, to go up from sort of 11%, 10, 11% where it is now, back up to sort of 18, 20%. But yeah, that's, that's 15 years. I mean, that's, mm. that's if every single uh, responsible department were mandated <clears throat> to have that as a macroeconomic game. Mm. That's if, if all policy was in line, trade policy, uh, fiscal policy, and you, you, you know, the Bank of England's mandate and everything else on, on, the, on the price of the pound. So 
if it was aligned, then you might do it, but you couldn't, it's not going to happen overnight. Literally, uh, it, you know, likewise, sorry, um, on housing, <clears throat> it's a tragedy, but I, I don't think, I don't think we can offer your generation anything uh, in the short term, you, you know, to correct. When Mrs. Thatcher got, got into power, about 42% of the public were in council houses, and about 8% are now, and, uh, but the, you know, we just haven't built enough houses. Effectively, that sector's been uh, demobilized and the state is now in there. The, the post-war state that Natalie uh, had and Macmillan had was, had rationing and was vastly poorer than our state now, but it built millions of houses. Now, you can have an argument about the architecture and the you know, planning mistakes, and there were some, but um, certainly in terms of capacity, we had more capacity to do things in that sector and that way than we have now. We, our capacity of the state to actually intervene in housing has been pretty much taken off the table. And again, it's not something that we could we change instantly. You, you, you'd have to get back into the business uh, and each local authority would have to get back in the business, but it's not, it's not undoable. I mean, it's perfectly doable. We, we argue a lot. A lot of our problems are caused by cultural problems of indifference. It's not to, it's not even money actually. I mean, you know, it's not really that. I mean. You know, <laughs> You could borrow, even if you borrowed for it, you still got an asset uh, on the other side, and you've got an income-bearing asset actually, which the income from council housing is higher than the, the uh, ten-year bond rate. So, uh, you know, you, you should get back into this. But um, uh, as I say, you know, it's to, to correct the thing, you'd have to you'd have to be committed to it for 10, 15 years. So, um, my answer to your question is that I'd nationalise the railways every night. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, the, the real answer is that you, there aren't any short-term solutions, really. Yeah. No, I think uh, I, I appreciate the, um, the boldness. And I think actually um, nationalising the railway is something that surprisingly is popular amongst young conservatives, or at least the ones I've spoken to. Um, at least, again, the ones that haven't necessarily drank the e uh, Lib Econ Kool-Aid, as you say. Um, one one thing that uh, was asked by one of the editors um, is is related to everything that you've just mentioned, which is that keeping jobs in Britain is obviously admirable, and we want we want greater manufacturing because, as you say, we, we need to make sure that we have something of a balanced economy at the very least. But given the modern day service based economy that we have, do you think that British people are actually prepared to work in in that kind of labor market uh, that's a really good question I um, that you're not talking about mills um, you know modern manufacturing isn't like that uh, the you know the, the the biggest contribution to exports in my region is, is Nissan and you know if you speak to the people that work there they're delighted it's very very well paid it's it's very well organized and um, in particular it's a proper manufacturing job which will you know has capabilities to support a family we're not actually if you look at the data with britain we're not actually short of jobs i mean we you know you could argue we've had almost you know full employment or arguably um uh, you know some some frictional unemployment and some long-term unemployment but actually there are plenty of jobs they're just lousy they're just they're just you know the, the what's happened in the west which we the people that govern us haven't been very honest about is that we've we've gutted industrial capacity. We've we've shipped out uh, high quality industrial jobs, which, as I say, are capable of supporting a family, and uh, we've replaced them with with sort of service based precarious uh, jobs of various kinds uh, that aren't as secure and don't and often don't require as much training. Um, so we've just been very short term in the way we've so the structure of the labour market's changed. Um, and uh, yeah, there's plenty of plenty of lousy jobs around. But if you you know, not everyone. I, I mean, you, I could I, I could ask you. I could flip the question 180 degrees, and I say, well, you know, if the choice is a good job at Nissan, or would you like to deliver pizzas, you know, delivery or whatever, what would you like? Oh, I, <laughs> I'd like to work in the Nissan factory, but I don't know if I'm educated or skilled enough to do so. Um, yeah. But no, I, I, I completely I completely agree. But I think at the same time that that, that poses a question of education because fundamentally, like you say, that the, the, the labour market is not the same as it was 50, 60 years ago. But that brings obviously further problems in terms of skill. And, uh, and, and we seem to be lagging really badly 
in terms of actual manual ability. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, it's easier to go to university these days than it is to get a trade. And, uh, and, yeah. and both in terms of the economic structure, but also in terms of mindset. So yeah. Just, like, how would you remedy that? Uh, well, the the, the 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 I mean the the answer, well the cause of the problem is is uh, fairly flaky policy, um, which really was exp- was expanded on a major initially, but then New Labour really went for it. Mm-hmm. Um, where you you get to a stage where because some European countries have half of the population, half of the school leavers go to university, will do the same. Well, um, that's been a disaster. I mean, that's a terrible policy. Uh, the, it makes it difficult for those that are left behind. I mean, certainly the, 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 the uh, cohort pressure, social pressure to go to university, if you're, indif- you know, if you're sort of not particularly committed, is much harder because everyone else goes, I'll go. Mm. Uh, but in any case, it's, 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 it's a fairly wicked and short-term type of policy for Blair to have done socially because it raises expectations that because you've got a degree that you'll have or that you're entitled to some sort of uh, lifestyle, which is you, you, you might think is commensurate with that. Well, the, on the supply side, there, there, no, I mean, there's no economy in the world that's structured to have half half of the employment market sort of director level high salaries. I mean, so that's just going to happen. So you well, you 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 end up with. I, 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 I'm just being honest. You know, a lot of people are overeducated, and uh, uh, you know, and then we wonder why, say, in the moral panic of last summer in the states, in Portland, places like Portland, Seattle, and so on, there were riots because everyone's unhappy. Well, one of the reasons people are unhappy is because people are underemployed, actually, and their expectations have been raised. So, if you look at it from the other side, so I mean, just to, to correct the the problem, you need to vastly uh, slim down the university sector. The university sector must be at least a third bigger than it needs to be, uh, and it's socially useful to be. So, it's, I'm sorry, you know, it's just true. Um, I hope it would, I mean, it could ha- that could happen from the demand side because, uh, as well, because I think, you know, um, intelligent 17, 18 year olds, you know, the type that, that wouldn't have gone to university before would have gone straight into industry with a couple of reasonable A levels. I mean, it should do so, unless you, unless you need to go to university, do some sort of vocational degree, uh, you know, for, 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 a, for a particular occupation. Uh, I think some kids are in the end just going to give it a flick because why should you get, you know, uh, why should you end up with 40 grand of debt when the vice chancellor is raking in a third, you know, three quarters of a million? Uh, it's outrageous, uh, really, really outrageous. So um, that's, that's the problem. You need to slim the university sector down. But on the other side, you need to start taking more of a sort of domestic approach to training because, uh, again, uh, uh, it's going to be a recurring theme. Liberal econs think it doesn't matter, you see. What, what, we're encur- what we've been encouraged to see, and this is both, is I'm not just going to go party politically because liberal econ is, is all over the Labour Party as well mm. uh, and the Lib Dems, obviously. So you, you, our political class, uh, uh, you know, the vast majority of them in the Commons even now, um, we're encouraged to think that in this large, open, liberal labor market uh, in the European Union, um, it sort of gets you off, gets you off the hook to train your own um, citizens. You know, because why bother? I mean, just why bother if you've got 450 million people? And um, you can get, you know, Svetlana to, to do the job and forget about Sharon. So that's that's what's happened. And, and, and um, uh, you know, and, and not, a lot of the migration was really high skilled and, and brilliant people, you know, and so they sort of, the liberal econ case, you could you could say was proved from that point of view, but uh, you're really letting down your own citizens there, and, and you're 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 paving the way to you know what happened in 2016, which was a lot of people were left behind. A lot of people. I mean, you could. It's not just you know David Goodhart's anywhere somewhere in us, but you know you could. A lot of our political our value divides now are just basically divided into two camps. I mean, there's those that do have done well with uh, under. A more open globalist system, and there's those that haven't. And um, so we, you know, particularly the thing that you mentioned there, Jake, the 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 the, um, uh, the lack of training for fellow citizens, particularly manual and, tr- and trades and basic stuff, you know, basic engineering and other things, uh, was 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 a political problem waiting to happen because it just wasn't valued. And uh, a lot of the rhetoric that you get from <clears throat> from Blair um, really. Uh, it was dismissing Labour's uh, previous uh, core supporters, the thing that the Labour Party was set up for. I mean, they've turned their back on that, didn't think it was important. And uh, they prefer, they actually devalued 
those trades and those people and those communities. And they were more interested in um, in, in uh, degree holders, and um, which is where we've ended up where we are now. Uh, it's where we've got a, a problem with the red wall that people misdiagnose. I think a lot of people still don't understand what's happening there. But anyway, let's go into it. Mm. Uh, well, I mean, I agree entirely. Um, something I've talked about before. Um, Brilliant. So uh, given that we've just gone over the halfway mark, so I just want to remind everyone, if you'd like to ask a question, please uh, raise your hand using the raise hand function or put a thumbs up react or something. Or if you want me to read out the question to Mr. Clouston, um, please type it in the chat. Um, before we open up to the q and A, I I don't know if you've noticed or if you've seen, but the Mallard's been running a, uh, a project this month called the Utopia Project, um, implemented by the new editor. Um, Samuel Martin. So we were asking, or we were curious to find out, what does your utopia look like? Um, it's a more, it's a more, it's a more rooted and communally based type of life. It's a, um, it's, it's. We always get accused. Any social conservative gets accused of wanting to go back to the fifties or whatever, or the, whatever <laughs> you're talking about. Um, but it's not, it's not really that. I mean, it, I think it, it's got to be part of the future. And what, what I'm talking about is what, what, what I call the common life, the life in common, uh, where, you know, people can, can feel attached and part and at home in a particular locality, or, you know, it might be a town or a, a city or a region or whatever, uh, feel part of it, feel comfortable with it, but also um, have some sort of common life with, with, with other human beings. It's not mediated by a, a screen or, or, or something dehumanizing like that, but actually together, you know, actually being together, speaking with each other. And I think a sort of more natural type of, of, of existence like that is, is really what we're looking for. And I, I think, I mean, we're going to work on, on, on it, but I think, um, I think we've, we've basically just got, got into sort of overreach with anywhere sort of globalism. And I think it's left a lot of people really quite disorientated. Um, obviously, the my utopia uh, involves, you know, friendship. You know, uh, philosophically, I'm an Epicurean. I, I think friendship is, is 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 a vital thing, and uh, and, and I think um, we we would always, you know, put family life very high in that as well, and extended family life. And I, pe I think people genuinely are happier in uh, in in these type of uh, sort of common life types of arrangements, and, and and the institutions are important. You know, public houses. Libraries, places that we are markets, places where we where we sort of see other human beings uh, and, and interact with them. And I think the thing that worries me about the way the world's turning, it doesn't have to be like this. Because you know, as I say, you're if you if you say that you value the common life, you're accused of wanting to go back. And no, I'm, I'm talking about the future. <laughs> I wouldn't be involved. I mean, if I didn't think it was about the future, I wouldn't be wouldn't be involved. You know, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be trying to to protect and sustain and enhance uh, the common life. So, yeah, that's that's what. It's rooted. It's place-based. It's 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 interactional and and it's us and less me, but more us. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, um, thank you very much, Mr. Cleason, for a, a very very interesting discussion. Um, I'm more than happy to open up to the Q and A. If anyone has any questions at all, um, please by all means. So we have a question from Samuel Martin, who is the editor of the Mallard. What would you say are the defining differences between the SDP and Blue Labour? Um, <clears throat> there are some. There aren't many. I, th I think. I think about eighty percent of the. I, I don't think there's any difference in the outlook. The basic outlook is exactly the same. The uh, the the the. the, the there are some differences which are quite significant. I mean, if you read, if you go onto their their their, their present website, they, they they say they're not communitarians, but what they're really talking about there is is a philosophical. Because I think they are communitarians. Um, uh, what they're talking about is a philosophical thing. What they mean by that is that they 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 they, they reject Blue Labour rejects the uh, communitarianism in the sense that uh, what the community says goes. I mean, I don't think we think that. That's not really, I'm not, you know, it's a philosophical point, but I'm not, our type of communitarianism is just, uh, is linkages and having some sense of duty to your fellow, uh, fellow person, a fellow human being. 
And so our communitarianism is basically Catholic social thought. You know, uh, it's, it's reciprocity and duty, really, obligation. It's not about me. And I think people are happier when they live like that. So, um, so that, that's the first technical thing. The second technical thing is that Morris, um, Morris Glassman uh, has, a, has a thing about industrial democracy in that all, if you look at all of his thinking right the way back to his thesis, which his doctoral thesis at Bologna was, was, um, was interestingly, was, uh, was uh, moderated by John Gray. Um, uh, we love John Gray, actually. I think he's, if, if we don't have a, an official philosopher, but if we did, um, but yeah, uh, Morris has been a, absolutely on industrial democracy from the start, and, and so he, I mean, they think, Blue Labour think that there's a, there's a very strong appetite for, um, for workers to be on boards, and, and actually workers on boards might, might end up with better management, actually, I, I, I do agree with that, but I think they think that there's this massive appetite for, for everyone to be involved, and we work, you know, we sort of have workers' councils and so on. And that's that. Maybe that's sort of you know. I mean, maybe that's a bit of Morris's Marxism coming into it. But it, we don't really share that. I think I, I think it was Tony Crossman said in the seventies. You know, that really people want to be doing their gardens on the weekend. <laughs> they don't want to be on workers' <laughs> councils. Um, so that's that's another thing. But I think probably the biggest difference between us and Blue Labour, and I don't want to go on about differences. They're not. There's, there aren't. I mean, basically, we're very very similar. But the other one is the constitutional thing. So they, you know, Blue Labour. I mean, I don't think Paul Embry's in favour of proportional representation. I don't think Morris is. Uh, so I think they are, you know, they, they, would be, they would probably be described as constitutional conservatives, whereas we would be described as, uh, you know, sort of uh, constitutional rebels or revolutionary. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I'm just making a note of all the people who've asked questions. So the next person with their hand up is Kayed Al-Haddad. Uh, Kayed, do you want to ask your question? Uh, oh, he's okay. He sent it in the chat. So uh, he said, "If we had proportional representation, would the different factions which make up the broad church of the duopolies within the Labour Party and the Conservative Party respectively split up to form their own parties?" Yeah, I think they would. I don't think it would be overnight, but um, <clears throat> you've got to remember that these are very broad, very very big broad coalitions, and there's a lot of overlap in the middle. I mean, colossal. I mean, a lot of you know the centrists. I, I did, really don't like the term centrist. You won't catch me using it very much, even though even though I lead a, a party which is sometimes described as that. But the, yeah, they, they, you could put them in any party. Um, but what it would do is it would it would give the British people a chance to vote honestly. Mm. And Peter Hitchens has said many times. I think he, he tried to sort of destroy the the Conservative Party, didn't he, in the in, in the in the noughties and said it you know is the principal obstacle. To conservatism, and I sort of agree with him, I guess, on that. I think that's probably a fair uh, appraisal. But but there should be a conservative party, shouldn't there? I mean, there are conservative thinkers, and there are conservative voters, so shouldn't there be a conservative party? And there should. Uh, and, and likewise, you know, if you're if you're a you know proper uh, you know proper socialist, uh, you'd argue that there should be a proper socialist party, shouldn't there? I mean, there there are socialists, and uh, why not? So. I think if you, you, I think if you, the dynamics, the electoral dynamics, a lot of people are voting Conservative and Labour and so on. I've done it myself as the, as the least worst option. On choice theory, it's just, okay, well, what's going to swing it for me? Well, I, I really don't like, you know, the, the alternative, so I'll vote for that. And it's, it's basically, we'd argue, just a rotten choice. Mm -hmm. One argument that is, is put to us quite a lot about PR is that, uh, you know, oh, we don't like PR, we don't believe in coalitions. And I would say, well, <laughs> you don't like them, you've been governed by them <laughs> uh, for, for 100 years. I mean, they're huge coalitions. They, you know, both of, these, both, of, both of these major parties are huge coalitions. The question is, do you do, you do your coalition first mm. and then put it to the, to the public to vote in just a binary choice? Or do you let the people vote, get the mix, and then you're going to get a coalition out of it? So, um, I mean, uh, to answer the question, the answer is definitely yes. I mean, I, I, our, the SDP's rate of progress, if we had PR, would be vastly, we'd be a decade or two ahead probably, you know. I mean, it, in fact, to be fair, had we had, we had PR, the, the party would be in Parliament now, um, you know, from the 80s. Because, you know, in, in 
the two elections in the 80s, the, the, you know, the coalition with the Liberals at the time got, you know, 25 and a half and 23%, which would have yielded, you know, a couple hundred, couple hundred MPs. So, uh, you know, that's, that's where we are. But I, I think we ought to, another aspect of PR which is important is that it's, it's um, the duopoly and the first past the post thing does, does lock out political ideas. Mm. And to go back to the start of the conversation tonight, uh, yes, I mean, we, you know, there are people, Boris Johnson is aware of what our project is, and a lot of them have read it, and a lot of them nick some of our <laughs> stuff occasionally, it's quite obvious, but that's fine, that's influencing people, and we've got friends that advise them as well, but, mm. you know, you, you, you're better off being able to vote for what you believe in. Mm. So we're going to have coalitions either way, you just prefer a more democratic yeah. coalition. That's, I think that's, that's perfectly fair. Um, fantastic. Next question comes from a George Scotland who asked, um, do you think the conception of an English parliament might fuel further division and give parties like the SNP greater incentive to use it as an excuse for independence? It's, 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 it's very difficult. I mean, it's not, it's, it's the, like, I mean, the establishing a, a Scottish parliament but not an English parliament is leaves England stuck, leaves the country stuck between stations. You know, you can't, it, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of uh, an imbalance and misalignment really there, which has to be dealt with somehow. And I think English people know that. Um, and in any case, just in terms of fairness and basic democracy, uh, you know, it's unsustainable. The present situation is unsustainable. Um, you could argue it either way. Certainly, I think, I, I, I look at Scots, you know, I mean, I just just to fill you in, I, I, my, I'm mainly Scots by blood, and I have, have strong links to the country. And although I was born south of the border, but um, uh, you know, I think I look at it in this way. I think I think Britain, you know, an entity like Britain is either disintegrating or integrating. You know, that's a fact. I mean, there's no doubt that it's been through a process of disintegration. Um, Blair's basic. Um, uh, basic approach to devolution was that it would it would kill. I think it was D Donald Dewar said, you know, Scottish uh, Scottish Parliament would kill the the demand for Scottish independence dead. Well, it hasn't. It, all it did was feed it, mm. um, and lot, even they were warned about it and they just ignored it. Um, and it, it has fed it. I mean, it's not it, the it's given the, the nationalists a platform. Uh, and an entity which you know they could they could they could get elected to campaign with and then uh, eventually get power and control over and everything they do uh, pretty much is 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 um, is aimed at, uh, at their secession from the UK. Uh, you know the 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 the, um, the the today or yesterday's announcement on 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 um, uh, pay for health service workers at four percent. I mean, that's at English expense, actually, because uh, of the Barnum formula. I mean, no one else could afford to do that. And that in itself is, 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 is wrong. I think people know it's wrong. You can't, you can't in, a, in, a, in, a, in the same state, treat different citizens uh, uh, differently. I mean, you've got to treat citizens on a par. Um, so this approach of, of, of giving more and more resources, giving more and more public spending and, and, um, and, and so on, has just, has just basically fed the tiger, I think, with, with Scots nationalism. But... You know, uh, the the if you went out on a program and said well, we want to abolish the Scottish Parliament and abolish the Welsh Assembly, I don't think you do very well. I think I don't think the Welsh were quite quite as keen on. It. I mean, I think that that vote on on the Welsh Assembly only was only carried because of the euphoria of uh, of, of New Labour's election victory. Anyway, I mean, and it was only just carried by you know fifty thousand, hundred thousand votes. So that's a slightly different one, but. Um, to try and answer the question, no, I don't, I don't believe that, and it can't be the case. I mean, it, you know, I, I think you can't, the, the present situation is not a stable one. So, you, you know, you, you, you have to address it. And ultimately, ultimately, the British Union will stay uh, together if, if the constituent parts feel sufficiently British. Now, you know, you can talk about structures, you can talk about taxation, or you can talk about all sorts of things. But, you know, the, the Scots will leave if they... If they if they if they feel more Scots than than British and, and I, I you know I, I would I would can the Scots pay for their own yeah they could they could of course they could you know they they could they could be a successful small country I'm no doubt but um, the you know if you want to keep the union together you have to um, think of ourselves as as 
as British money. And if you don't, then it, it, it perhaps it will fail. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next up on the list, we have Mr. Chris Winter, who is the publicity officer for the Mallard. Um, Chris, would you like to ask a question? Yes. Um, hello, Mr. Clouston. It's very nice to have you here. Um, my question is, what are your opinions on Benjamin Disraeli, and uh, do any of your views align with his? Um, well, you're testing my history now. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think if you're talking about Sybil, about two nations uh, and one nation, then I would describe ourselves as an Israeli and uh, one nation. Uh, I almost said conservatives, but but you, you get my gist. Yeah, I think the the, the divisions in society are tremendously uh, significant, and uh, you know you, you only have to look at value divides in in most Western countries. The United States is the biggest problem, but. Yeah, the level uh, to tolerate a level of inequality, which is is going to pull your nation apart, um, you cease to be a nation. So in that sense, yeah, I mean, I I I I'd uh, happily put it this way: I'm more I'm, I'm more for a Disraeli than, than a Gladstonian. Put it that way. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, next up, we have Mr. Andrew Trovaluski, who's an assistant editor at the Mallard. Andrew. Uh, Thank you, Jake, and uh, thank you, Mr. Clouston, for your talk so far. It's been very interesting. My question is this. Why do you think young social conservatives should choose to join the SDP and try to influence politics with you guys instead of taking what many would assume to be the natural route for social conservatives, which would be to kind of join the Tories and try to influence them and, and conduct a, a kind of long march through the Tories? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I, I, I think it's, better, it's more fun with us and you get better, much quicker growth, of course, and you can see, I mean, it's, it's, it is very, very valuable. I mean, I, 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 I was chatting to a, a friend, we, we got a, a, a very important nomination through <clears throat> for a, a, a forthcoming election, quite a significant one we hope to announce quite soon uh, today, and um, I was talking to the nomination officer, you know, remember the, the Birmingham a conference in 2017 there were very few people there you know and the nice thing about building your own organization building it up um is that it does get bigger and it's it's you know at every le at ev in every quarter and every year we get we we um, we grow and we get better election results and we, we can test more elections and it's simply perhaps it's better fun to do that um as well but you're quite right that both are long marches i don't I mean, the, the odd, the really, really odd thing about this is, and it's it's the, it's the prime reason why um, why we're doing it is that we're the only ones doing it. I mean, um, as a political project, as a, as a as a political party, a proper political party, we're the only ones doing doing it, trying to offer the public this this particular type of this particular blend of politics, and uh, we're very, very confident. Um, I'm not. I've never. I mean, we will lose a lot of deposits, <laughs> but your, you know, um, uh, you know, happiness is about your expectations being met in life. And uh, if your expectation is to get, uh, you know, 100 votes in a local election and you get 200, you're very happy. Um, we're, we're getting to the stage now after sort of three or four tries that we're going to start winning seats and take seats off, off the Labour Party and, and, and Conservatives. And that's that's a great place for us, you know. I mean, it's normal. When I when I sta when I stood as a Tory a couple of times, you know, once in a general election, once in a council election, I won both. Oh, I, I didn't win the general election, but I won the district one quite easily, uh, you know. And it wasn't just down to the candidates; it was probably nothing to do with me. Uh, it was just it just, just you you're in a very very large block. Um, but they're both long marches. The, the the thing that I'm absolutely convinced about is that. As I said before at the start, you know, if you did a blind tasting of our policies, you know, about 40, 50 percent of the public would agree with us. And if you know that, then pretty much the sky's the limit. It will take time, but it's, it, you know, it's good fun to be doing this. And I and actually Claire Fox advised us when I was chatting to her uh, last year. You know, she is strongly in favor of what we're doing. She, I think she hasn't joined her. She's a bit of a libertarian, really. But she said, you know, it's good to see some group, you know, a group of people that believe in something and are not, you know, just joining something. They're building their own organisation. And, uh, and I, you know, I have to say I agree with them. Brilliant. Thank you so much. 
So, uh, the event was scheduled to last for an hour, but I've got a further four questions. Are you happy to carry on, Mr. Cluson? Yeah, yes, uh, yes, by all means. Fabulous. So, uh, up next I've got Mr. Connor Nightingale. Connor, would you like to ask your question? Yes, hello William, hello Jake. First of all, you as a party in favour of proportional representation, yes? Yes. Which form, either single transferable vote where say constituencies and regions are elected all on PR, as is in the Senate, or the alternative vote, which I personally don't like, where constituencies are done on PR, no, sorry, constituencies are done on first past the post, but regions are done on PR, as in what happens at Holyrood. Which one are you in favour of? Oh, this is getting really cynical now. Uh, <laughs> um, well, we, Patrick O'Flynn, was we, we did a policy board two years ago, and obviously we're in favour of PR, and uh, but Patrick was very keen on having uh, uh, policy pledges, and we still got that format. Actually, we still try and keep policy very clear, you know, uh, so the public can understand it. Uh, you know, tight, clear pledges, um, and the pledges for PR. We we deliberately didn't go into systems at that stage. We will. Okay. I think we have to before the next election. We will have to uh, uh, sort of explain how we think it could could happen. Um, so what I'm about to tell you is not party policy. It's just my okay. option. I think you have to. You have the aim of it is to have a system where uh, seats match votes to a greater extent. And that, you, you know, you don't have to have one that's absolutely proportional. But you have to. You have to have one which doesn't uh, produce, you know, 3.8 million votes for UKIP and Douglas Carswell as the sole MP. You have to have a system where. If if a, if a political grouping, as in 1983, which I worked on, uh, you know, doesn't get 25 and a half percent in 23 seats, when the Labour Party got one and a half percent more than us and got 210 seats, that's absurd. So you have to have a system where it's 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 you know broadly seats um, and votes are roughly matched. Um, having said that, I think you also have to have a system which matches connects. Uh, and you expect me to say this, uh, uh, connects um, voters to a geography and connects yeah. those that are elected to a geography, physical geography. I, I, I really loathe the idea of top-up seats, national top-up seats, and I don't like the Hollywood system. Yeah, yeah. I think that's, you know, you, you're already into a situation where a cynic would say on their own system that it's, uh, that it's a selectorate, not an electorate. And there is really, there is truth in that. Because apart from the, um, apart from the swing states and the the, the uh, marginals, largely uh, the commons, the composition of the commons is decided by the selection processes of the two or three parties or four parties. Um, so anyway, the, the answer is you have to have, so you want proportionality and you want uh, geographical connectedness. And the only the only system really that does that is is to have. A system that we know already, which we've been using for the European elections, which is the De Hondt system okay, on good. a multi-member seat basis. So what you'd end up with in the parliamentary system, you'd have to raise, uh, you'd have to raise the size of the seat, the physical size of the seat, to get four or five MPs okay, in yeah. the in the same seat. Okay, okay. And then if you have De Hondt, then you halve back on on you know the the party with the big the largest number of votes gets the first. And then it halves back, and the final, the, you know, as a smaller party, we would be contesting really the fifth seat. So when you've halved everyone else's votes, technically you, it's a bit mathematical. But you're, if you're sing, you know, if you've got you know fifty thousand votes, you might get a seat. And it doesn't. De Hondt doesn't produce exact proportionality, but it, it produces vastly greater proportionality than we would have. And so, for my money, and it's not SDP policy, but for my money. What you want is is a, is is to haunt. Okay, so have okay. a look at that. Okay. Yeah. It's also it's also funny you mentioned on coalitions because talking of Holyrood, we have the SNP Green Coalition, which, in my opinion, isn't a coalition. It is a coalition of two parties, which are, in my opinion, the same in every way. Yeah, I, I just, I mean, I, I agree with, I, I, I mean, I, well, the, Green, the Greens would say they're not, but the, the, the point is that I, I think it's incumbent. The Greens get, a, get away with, uh, because they've gone for this, this, this sort of federalist thing, they get, get away with 
getting votes in, say, local council elections in, in, you know, throughout England. People vote Green mm-hmm. without understanding that the Green Party want to split up the UK. And yeah. I think if you're, I'm, you know, if you care about the UK in that sense, I think we should all spread the word. Yeah. <laughs> Tell people. Yeah, the Greens are basically the props that are keeping Sturgeon up. Yes, no, they're, 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 I know, I mean, and you saw that in the voting with the recent uh, debacle as well. No, I think they, I, I, as I say, just spread the word, uh, you know, about what the Green, um, the Greens are secessionists. So if you want that, vote for it, then I would. <laughs> thank uh, you. Thank um, you. Thank you very much, Connor, and uh, thank you, William. Um, our next question is from um, Siobhan Brown. Siobhan? Uh, hello, Mr. Claston. Wonderful Hi. to speak to you. Uh, first of all, incumbent on me to mention the two identical paintings behind me, which will, <laughs> which will draw comment. Um, I didn't choose that. Um, <laughs> my question is, you mentioned nationalizing the railways, which I am absolutely for. Uh, those that know me can attest to my thoroughgoing socialism. <laughs> How would you suggest that we return industry to the country? Because it, it, it may surprise some people to learn that as a socialist, I do believe that we need to have some protection of the industry within this country. Otherwise, how are we to build a society? I, t- I totally agree with you. Yeah, um, <clears throat> the just on railway nationalization first, um, yeah, I mean, it's basic. The, the no, no railway system works at a profit uh, in that sense. So to, 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 to have a policy which, which major implemented um, of, of the state is still doing the heavy lifting in terms of the track and signaling and so on uh, at a cost of six or seven, no, I think it's nine billion for that. And then, and then to just allow people to run franchises in a sort of disjointed way uh, is, is, is phony. Anyway, I mean, you know, the, the, the heavy lifting is still done by the state. It's, it's uh, not so it is very expensive relative. It is, yes, and it, yeah, and exactly, and, and the and the purpose of public transport is to ferry the public around, and it's it's a service, partly a service to the public. It's not really um, required to, to make a profit in a sense. I mean, all of these lines actually genuinely run at a loss. Um, but that aside, you the, the system we've ended up with is is really uh, is crazy. Um, and, and just to pull the leg of a conservative, the or the conservatives, um, you know, it, it's not that they don't think the state can run railways. It's just that they think our state can't because the, if you look at who runs them, they they've asked the, the German and uh, Trenitalia run them and uh, SNCF run them, and they basically the Tories think anyone can run them except us, which is ridiculous. I mean, they were invented here. Um, and also, I think it doesn't allow you to convene any sort of national pride in your national railway system, you know, and, and, and I think they, the railway system should be a, a symbol of national pride and engineering and so on. But I go further. I wouldn't, I wouldn't stop with just running the railways. I mean, I think, I think you know, Crewe and Swindon, we have a, a tradition, had a tradition of, of locomotive manufacture and railway manufacture, Metropolitan Camel in Birmingham. You know, uh, we had it and we let it go. And it, we let it go because, uh, you know, too many econ liberals are indifferent about this. So, I, you know, my model would be to, to have a national railway network that we can, as an emblem of pride in British engineering and management, but also construction. I, I, I'd like to bring um, bring that back. And I, I'd like to get the engines, engine yards and crew producing our own trains. There's no reason why we can't. Uh, literally, it's just a matter of will to do it. Um, so that's the first part. On the second, uh, Siobhan, on the second part, part of the question, um, I, I may, I don't know your particular type of socialism, but we're social democrats. We do have some people that describe themselves as socialists in the party, and that, that's fine, but we are social democrats. So our, our type of um, trade policy, industrial policy, is, is to try and aim for reindustrialization. industrialization If you're hinting in your question, should we have... Um, should we have some sort of trade friction, trade barriers to enable our, our uh, industry to rebuild and reshape? Yes, we should. And we should have an aim uh, in trade policy to reshore um, and manufacture anything that we can here um, if we can do it efficiently. And I think unless you have that aim, then you literally, if you're indifferent to what is made where and by whom, you end up where we are. 
uh, where you know virtually everything's made in, in China and, and we've gutted our own industry, which is not helpful to our own citizens. So, uh, yeah, we, I, you know, I, I suppose you would say I would say this, but we, I don't think there's a, a more pro manufacturing industry party uh, in the political landscape than us. Thank you, Mr. Claxton. Cheers. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And uh, f uh, oh, sorry, oh, we've got two questions left. Um, one from Andrew Mullinder, who says, it seems that the two major groups within the Conservative Party are on the one hand Cameroon pro-business liberals, and on the other hand Thatcherite libertarians. Do you think that the lack of traditional social conservatives in the upper ranks of the Conservative Party is a reason the woke march through the institutions has accelerated in the decade they've been in power? That's a great question. Um, I think the answer must be yes. And I think I, I also think, um, although it's a much, much deeper uh, intellectual question, I think the I think econ liberalism has sort of seeded um, what we call progressive ultra progressivism or what some people call woke. Um, there's certainly a relationship there uh, which which needs to be uh, you know, properly examined. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, don't, I honestly don't know. I mean, I, I, I think any any even moderate social conservative in the Conservative Party must feel feel pretty pretty isolated, to be honest. I don't see any. The Prime Minister's not a social conservative, never has been one. He was a social democrat there once, because <laughs> he joined the SDP to get elected as Oxford Union um, <laughs> leader, didn't he? But uh, briefly, but he wasn't, it was only a technical thing. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think it's a major problem. Um, I, you know, I think philosophically they, they, they must bear responsibility. I mean, people, people wonder where, you know, hyper liberalism and progressivism came from. I think some people make the mistake of thinking it arrived, you know, sort of overnight. It didn't, really didn't. I mean, it's been, you know, the, the seeds are in the Bloomsbury group and the seeds are in the people that Chesterton reacted to in the late 1800s. I mean, you've always had this group of, 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 of sort of ultra anywheres that don't really care about the state and the society. They're a lot, an intellectual tradition. A lot of, a lot of them, uh, you know, basically had contempt for their, for their own country. Always preferred uh, um, uh, the cultures next to us rather than their own culture. And I think that, you know, it, I mean, certainly Peter Hitchens argues it goes well all the way back to the Norman conquest, the Saxon and the Normans. It's very deep. Um, but just to get back to Andrew's uh, point, I mean. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you if you've got if you had some sort of Gramsci-esque takeover of every single cultural institution by by hyper progressives, uh, you'd have to ask yourself, well, under whose watch has that ha happened? And you've had the you know, Tories have been in eleven years now, and it's happened under their watch, so they must bear responsibility. But I, the word I always use to characterise the Conservative Party is indifference. They're not. They won't hold any line, you know, they'll never hold a line on anything. I mean, you know, it doesn't really matter in industry, you know, every single industry is allowed to go uh, and you could be a world leader and they'll say, well, it doesn't really matter, you know, just buy it in or it doesn't really matter. It's, the, the sort of doesn't really matter thing is a sort of stamp of the Conservative Party, the, the way uh, it's very deep in their thinking and, um, you know, just a couple of years ago, you know, the, the the, the the Osborne <clears throat> Cameron approach was 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 typical of this because they these these two uh, you know embraced G and wanted to a close relationship with China. We must have a relationship with China. We hope it's a, a safe one. But to sort of bend over backwards and offer roll out the carpet to 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 say, well, can you build us a nuclear power station? I mean, we start we we basically started civil you know civil nuclear power uh, and um, and on Huawei. <laughs> I mean, you know, it only. I mean, I, I'm. I don't want to be too rude because probably maybe maybe Conservative Party members in front of me. But it, I, the thing is, it's it's only a Conservative Party that could go to Huawei and say, you know, could, do you want to do you want to just you know build us our five G network? You know, the fact that you're controlled by the Chinese Communist Party doesn't really matter very much. It doesn't really matter. You know, you switch us switch the lights off. So yeah, I just think it's a it's an attitude of mind. There's so much of of, of so much of politics is downstream from culture. And uh, all, all we want, we you know, I'd argue we don't want much, you know, as social democrats. We don't want, we want the political class and those elected in parliament to greater reflect 
the ideas and, and values of the, of the sort of British hinterland. That's the project. That's what we're trying to do. And at the moment it doesn't. And, 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 and if it did, you wouldn't get the problems in the BBC and the other institutions that we've got. Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much. So our final question comes again from uh, Chris Winter. Chris? Hello again. Um, so I'm an electrical engineering student I'm studying at Newcastle University and uh, a big part of my study is involving uh, renewable energy, smart grids uh, and power, power engineering. Um, what is the STP's uh, view on, on uh, renewables, uh, maybe specifically the, the Conservative Party's uh, renewable plan. Um, what is the SDP's view on uh, nuclear power? Um, and also, uh, just as a, a tangent to that, what is the SDP's view on nuclear weapons? Thank you. Uh, well, very, very, uh, very simply. I mean, we're pro. I mean, I think the I think renewables. Are, you only have to look at the graphs to know that. The contribution that that we now get from the new renewables is quite su substantial. You know, I think coal's down. Coal, the big switch was was coal to gas. The dash for gas, and that, that helped with our emissions. And coal's down one and a half percent, negligible now. Uh, and renewables, you know, uh, will will form um, a significant part. But I think they've been expensive. I mean, I think the I think this has been an expensive route. And to link it to the second part of your question. Uh, the the base load has to be nuclear because uh, if it's not if it's not um, windy uh, you're in trouble you know and, and storage uh, and capacity um, is, is the key to it so I, I think we I'd describe us as strongly pro nuclear power but uh, you won't be surprised I, I, I'd be strong domestically uh, produce nuclear power I think you've got to get these industries back and I think national resilience in these things really matters. I think it's also, I mean, energy policy has been really interesting because it's been one of the, it's a sort of um, poor cousin, isn't it, in, in, in policy. Uh, you know, Blair came in in 97 with the, the the best sort of economic legacy of anyone, you know, golden legacy. And, and, and given what he was given, it was a disastrous government, you know, led us to war and, uh, you know, ended up with a financial crisis, didn't do any proper socialism anyway. So disastrous <laughs> government. But, but. You know, had had he been a sensible politician and not a uh, politician that wanted to go off uh, fighting ridiculous wars in the Middle East, uh, he might have had a look at that, and and and, and he might have invested, uh, you know, long term in in, in um, British uh, energy capacity. And of course, we'd be better off if we had done. So the the, the final thing is uh, nuclear weapons. I mean, yeah, we're we're, we're pro nuclear weapons. Always have been. It, it, it's a uh, as Owenite, we describe ourselves, and I do anyway, as an Owenite type social democrat. And in the 80s, we had our, our scars on our backs um, fighting the liberals who famously in the uh, conference at Torquay voted to abolish nuclear weapons. And I think David Owen was a little bit upset about that. But it, it did expose, it was very useful actually, it did expose that um, the fact that social democracy is an us thing. Uh, and, it, and philosophically, it's very different from liberalism. But liberalism is, a, is is concerned with individual rights, really, a me thing. And um, and we warned we warned against the merger with the with the liberals because the philosophies are quite different. And that was an you know an example on in, in terms of defence, which which was which was quite stark. So yeah, we're we're, we're pro nuclear power, pro nuclear weapons in this world, and uh, we want high base load. Uh, and energy policy is very important. So yeah, that's basically our answer. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Ms. Cleuson. Um, everyone that still has a few questions, I'm really sorry, but we have run on by about 15 minutes, and obviously we don't want to take up much, too much of Mr. Cleuson's time. Uh, but as, as I know from experience, uh, Mr. Cleuson is always quite receptive on social media if you want to ask him a question directly, so I'm sure uh, he'd be happy to answer any in that respect. Um, but. Mr. Cluson, thank you so much for such a wonderful evening and for so many really fascinating points. Thanks very much for the opportunity and good luck with the mala. Just keep it up, and I'm looking forward to um, you guys producing a print, physical print edition one day. I think that's very important to try and do that. Uh, and uh, as I say, thanks very much for the for the opportunity. We've had a good day down at Hartlepool filming. Uh, you'll see one or two things come out next week. Uh, and uh, so a glass of Merlot awaits me now. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Thank you. Have a great yeah. evening, everyone. And uh, thank you again, Mr. Cluston. Best of luck for Hartlepool. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Take Bye -bye. care. Bye-bye.